Hey everybody, welcome back to The Pressing Matters. I'm Scott, thank you for tuning in today. Thank you for your support. Sorry, I'm looking a little shaggy today. Um, I just got through a bout of COVID, so I'm like trying to get back on my feet. I haven't been out of the house to get a haircut and it's been a little bit tiring. So, but um, I'm back and I've been wanting to do this particular review for a little while. This is for another living stereo title and this one is the the Reiner sound so this is Fritz Reiner Chicago Symphony Orchestra recorded in Orchestra Hall 1959 it was released and um, I'll tell you all about that in a second I wanted to show you a couple books um, that are of interest one is easily available one is impossible to find so uh, I finally finally got a copy of the RCA Bible it took me years uh, to find a copy. Um, it's out of print. It was only printed twice in a small amount. It is by Jonathan Vallon of uh, the Absolute Sound fame. And it's a wonderful reference for any RCA uh, living stereo collector. It um, Unfortunately, he hasn't put it back into print. It is not printed is, is not in a PDF online where you can look at it or download it. It's like impossible. Um, you know, dog-eared copies are in the hands of collectors and it isn't until they no longer need them that you can get, grab one. And that's kind of what happened with this. So I, I finally got that. So I can use that as a reference too when I'm talking about the Living Stereo line. Um, also, there's this book that's out and around. I have it listed in my store. It's on Amazon um, as well. Um, but uh, Kim Weston has done this and a Mercury Living Presence catalog. So this is more of a catalog rather than commentary. It's an exhausted, exhaustive um, listing of every number possible for the living stereo and mono um, titles. So she goes through everything. She pulled together so many resources to put this together. It's a labor of love. It's a lot of work. Um, it's not like an engaging read, but it is a reference book that collectors may want to have because they may wonder why they're missing all these numbers in the series and they can look in here and check and see what they were. So I can recommend that for that type of um, research. And the RCA Bible, you know, start putting your feelers out because that is a wonderful reference as well. Let's actually see what Jonathan Vallon said about the Reiner sound. I actually looked at it, looked at it um, briefly. It's uh, 2183. I think he focused a lot on the um, CD, which is unusual, but he actually felt the CD was one of their better CDs. So. Uh, he says, um, it's a superb recording, especially the Rachmaninoff, Isle of the Dead, although the Ravel Rhapsody is top-notch, too, and played with extraordinary sensitivity and elan by a conductor who was not famous for his light French touch, and that's true. Excellent transparency, fidelity, dynamics, and texture. One of my favorites, and undisputably one of the great RCAs. Uh, he gives it a 10 plus plus and he reviewed the 1s 1s pressing and uh, He has a list price here. I think this is way outdated, but he said it's uh, goes for about hundred and thirty dollars um, My original went for a dollar so <laughs> I was glad about that. Unfortunately, it's not in the greatest shape, but um, I'm so glad to have this you know taped seams and all this is actually a, a 17S, 24S, so maybe not the best example. It is on the Shaded Dog label. And, you know, I treasure this album, I love it, but um, it's got some, some issues, some nasty ticks and pops, unfortunately. But, um, the things I listen for when listening to this album, especially when doing comparisons with other versions. The opening of Rhapsody Espanol, 
It needs to have that magical, misty quality. It is supposed to be evocative of Spain. It's supposed to be impressionistic in a way. And you need to get that feeling like it's an early misty morning and things are just starting to wake up. Um, the original pressing does this very, very well. And part of the reason is the delicacy and the strings and the other instruments in the upper area. They have to kind of be just just right, not too bright, not too not too clear in a way. It's uh, the to be the to be glow of this mastering really helps this effect. And it's there on the original pressing. Another thing I listen for for this record is the dynamic swell and impact of the climaxes in Rhapsody Espanol. So this is something that can vary over these different pressings. And um, the there's times when the music quickly moves up in intensity and volume and power. And it has to come off right. It should be quite shocking, actually, and quite impressive. And some of these do this better than others. <clears throat> um, this is kind of the standard for that. But um, when in comparison to the others, this one is a little bit, little bit subdued. But this is a beautiful record. If you have an original pressing, especially if you have a 1S and it's in good shape, you're probably all set with the Reiner sound. Um, the third piece on the record um, is another area where I look for certain characteristics. It's a string heavy uh, piece. It's a tone poem um, called Isle of the Dead by Rachmaninoff. It takes up the whole side. Um, it has some really intense string climaxes and brass climaxes that need to come off cleanly and clearly and not get confused. Um, the beauty of the strings is so important on this. And of course, the originals always have that. They have that beautiful, beautiful, lovely tone. And it's really hard to capture on other other reissues. But um, yeah, this one is good. The dynamics are a little bit re restrained. Maybe the 1S is a little bit more powerful in that regard, but um, a good pressing. Um, if you have an original, you're probably quite happy with it if it's in good shape. Uh, the, the next one to come around was the Chesky. Now, um, I just was watching a, another channel uh, called Audiophilia, and I've really gotten into this channel because the gentleman that um, does his videos there is uh, a conductor, so he has a musician sensibility when he's discussing these Golden Age classical records. And it's very, very enlightening. And I suggest you take a look at Audiophilia. Really a nice channel. Um, he was doing a, a piece on Chesky Records. Um, he didn't mention this one in that particular episode, but it did prompt me to pull out some of my Cheskies and give them a fresh listen. Uh, this one, I of course had it in line for this review. <clears throat> the Cheskies are tube masterings. Um, this one was uh, mastered by Jack Edelman. So he might not be a familiar name to you, but um, this was pressed uh, on uh, mass, what is it, plated at Teldec? Plated at Teldec, I think, I think it's pressed there too. But um, this is the 150 gram pressing. Now there are 180 gram pressings of the Chesky records, which are very highly recommended. I think they are better sounding. The two that I have, our reference recordings. Sometimes these are a little bit less so, but I got them as soon as they came out. I was so excited to get, you know, a repress of a living stereo title, even though the jackets were not the original jackets. Um, this one is actually quite good. I think this replaced the original on the on the um, absolute sound list. It retains a lot of the the pleasures of the original pressing, that delicacy, the beautiful string tone. It has a little bit more extension in the climaxes and it comes off quite well on most of the record. I think Rhapsody Espanol 
sounds great on this. Um, Pavan for a Dead Princess, which is closes out side one, is a very quiet cut. And this conveys all the beauty that's uh, in that piece as well. It is a, a very soft, gorgeous piece of music. Um, Isle of the Dead came off a little bit less so on this. Um, I don't know why, but it seemed a little bit confused in some por in some portions of the the track. But it's a nice a nice sounding record, and I can see why they replaced it uh, replaced the original with the Chesky back in the day. Um, the third one is let's see is Bernie Grunman's classic. Now. I have this and I have the 45, so 45 comes on five LPs and yeah, that's so excessive, that's so excessive and wasteful, um, but whatever, it was a trend at the time, I guess it's still a trend, I mean, 45s are still, still happening, the Atlantic 75 series that was just announced is all 45s and people are kind of like Ugh. <laughs> Personally, I'll probably do a video on my views on 33 versus 45. I kind of mention it in these in these things here, but Classical and 45 has to be An occasional thing. I, I don't want all my albums on four records or five records. It's just too much space it's too much flipping, it's too many side breaks, and not enough sonic benefit. So, this is Classics 33. Now, um, this one, like most of the Classics, sort of opens the window, and you hear everything in vivid detail. The problem with them is, Bernie's mastering tends to be a little bright, and on this record, it comes across as too much, I think. Um, on the Rhapsody Espanol, there's there's points where there's uh, castanets and things going on, like exotic things, and it just it comes off a little too too bright. Um, the string tone's a little coarser. It's not quite as beautiful as the f previous two efforts, the original and the Chesky. It does have dramatic swell and impact and bass impact on those few climaxes in Rhapsody Espanol. But side two, I cannot, I cannot recommend on, on the classic because it's so string heavy and there's string heavy climaxes, it just doesn't, it doesn't sound right. It makes me want to take it off. So I have to disqualify that one. Maybe on another system, it might sound perfect. But even on mine, which is all tubes, it doesn't quite warm it up enough. And the classic 45 is, is better. And it's kind of cool to have Rhapsody Espanol, which is the showpiece of the album. I mean, it's the showstopper. It's nice to have that um, with uh, the 45 format. It's broken up in a nice place, and you really hear the power of those climaxes. It's kind of fun in an audiophile way. But that leaves us to this. So this is um, AP's um, 33. Now, one thing I want to mention, and I mentioned it before, I don't want to harp on it, but this record um, is the only one I've received in this series that came with a matte jacket. So, you know, they're all high gloss and this is not. And I was really disappointed about it. I reached out to them and they said that was an intentional choice for the production of this record. Previous pressings of it um, by AP were gloss. I'm sure future ones will be gloss. This was a mistake, apparently, and they're just not going to reprint the jackets, just putting them out there. So I'm just putting it out there that if you have to have a gloss jacket, you might want to wait until it's confirmed that they've gone back to the gloss jacket on this. It's also a little, it's a little lighter too. Not, I'm a little disappointed with that. 
But the sound is another story. Um, I wanted to say something about Isle of the Dead. Isle of the Dead, um, you know, for years, it wasn't my favorite cut on this. The first side was my favorite, and it still is. But Isle of the Dead, you know, the more I learned about it, the more I found it intriguing. It's a very gloomy tome poem based on a very gloomy painting. I'm going to show you in a cutout here. Um, and, and it's funny, when I saw that painting, I was immediately reminded of the Val Luton directed film called Isle of the Dead. It is part, it is part of a little group of films, including Cat People and some others from the 40s that uh, relied on the use of light and shadow and were very, very effective thrillers. And he did one called Isle of the Dead. And it totally reminds me of the painting, the boat going out to the shore, the odd, mysterious island. And you got to see that movie. It's really cool. But um, the music really does kind of convey that dark, dark sea and kind of mysterious goings on. It doesn't really resolve into anything. It's more of a mood piece, but it does have a few climaxes. As I said, it, it employs a lot of strings, but it does use full orchestra. And on the AP, I think it comes off best. Um, they have all the strengths of the classic in terms of dynamics and bass, but they tone down that brightness and return to a more lush tube sound. So it is not a tube mastering, but whatever they're doing to equalize it um, gives it gives the, gives the strings a nice, pleasant quality. And also on the opposite side, the things that I listen for are there. The beautiful, delicate whisperings of the opening of Rhapsody Espanol, the powerful, swelling, dynamic impact of the crescendos in Rhapsody Espanol, the absolute beauty and quiet, quiet, um, quiet, uh, I don't know what the word is. Well, let's just say beauty of uh, Pavant for a Dead Princess. Sounds lovely. And the best thing about this is this music um, beyond Rhapsody Espanol requires silent surfaces. Absolutely. And in this one, we get that. We get a beautiful silent surface, no interruptions with ticks or pops. So I can highly recommend the AP, but all of these have something to offer and none of them are bad records. I would just say if your system tends towards bright um, to kind of maybe avoid the classics. There's not much reason to get a classic when this is available now. So um, the AP is my choice. And when I finally downsize everything, I will probably only keep the AP. But um, I'd like to have them all for these shootouts. So I guess for the time being, while I have a channel, I will be trying to find places to store all these things. Um, that is my take on the Reiner sound. Let me know what you think in the comments. Until next time, I'm Scott for The Pressing Matters. Have a great day.